Thanks, Joe. Great. Thanks, Megan. Thanks so much for inviting me. And um, I just want to underscore what uh, Megan said. We really want you to be outside. We want you to be enjoying yourselves, um, taking advantage of all of the incredible uh, landscapes that we have here in California in the Bay Area. Um, but we want you to be safe. And we will be talking tonight about um, tick-borne illness prevention. Um, there is Lyme disease in California. Um, and so I'm gonna be walking you through some of the science on that. And as you put questions in the Q&A, Megan is actually going to interrupt me. Um, but if you ask a question that I know I'm gonna be covering later on in the presentation, I'll just indicate that. So don't hesitate, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. So here we go. Uh, so why are we talking about tick? Um, the reason is because as we just said, unfortunately, outdoor pursuits put you at risk of um, encountering a tick and maybe being bitten by a tick, and um, that tick could be infected. So we want you to be alert and know what to look for in terms of being aware of ticks. Uh, you're here tonight to educate yourselves about the dangers of tick bites, but we also want you to know what to do if you're bitten. And very importantly, to be able to advocate for yourself with a medical professional um, and insist on early treatment. Bay Area Lyme Foundation was founded about 10 years ago. And our mission is to make Lyme disease easy to diagnose and simple to cure, because currently it is difficult to diagnose. Uh, we don't have accurate uh, diagnostic tests. And if it's not caught early, it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to cure. So let's talk about where the ticks are. This is kind of a little bit of fun. Um, every year we see these um, stories in the news and in the media saying, oh my gosh, it's supposed to be just like an absolutely huge tick season this year. Uh, this year we are predicting that because of all the rain, uh, ticks love moisture. Um, here, these two hikers are blithely going along saying, gosh, well, I haven't seen a tick and, and they're unaware that they're actually on the back of a tick. So it's just a little gag. But we do know from research that Bay Area Lyme Foundation conducted back in 2016, we actually launched a national citizen science project. And we got people from all over the United States, not just in California, to send ticks to one of our funded labs based in Arizona. And what we discovered was that we have uh, recorded ticks everywhere that you see a little red blob on this map. That's where people sent in ticks uh, from places that um, had previously not been recorded by the CDC. So we know that ticks and infected ticks are on the move. As you can see here, um, everybody thinks that Lyme is an East Coast problem, and of course the uh, Northeastern uh, states are very impacted by Lyme disease and various different co-infections from the black-legged or deer tick. But here in California, this is the range of uh, the Western black-legged tick, which is a very close um, cousin in terms of species. They're almost identical, actually. And you can see that um, ticks are being found in places that have not yet been uh, recorded by the CDC. And in fact, you can find the paper that talks about this on our website. It's also in PLOS One. And uh, you know, we have ticks in 83 counties in 24 states where they were previously undetected. And over the course of the year, we collected uh, 21,000 uh, ticks from 49 states. And importantly, we discovered that all life stages of the three major tick species that we know vector or um, you know, transmit pathogens to humans were actually infected. And we discovered that because we were received in the lab um, ticks that were female ticks that were actually pregnant and who um, laid eggs while they were in the male. And then when these uh, packets of ticks were opened, um, we were then able to test the tick larvae, and we did discover that um, the tick larvae was actually infected with pathogens, which was something that we didn't, we knew that certain types of pathogens could be in tick larvae, but we didn't realize how prevalent that was until we conducted this citizen science project. 
So if we think about just California, what we know currently, um, although the thing about science, the thing about tick ecology is that when you go out, you gather data, whether we do it, whether other scientists do it, or whether the California Department of Public Health does it, what you're getting on any day is literally a snapshot of data. And the ticks and how infected ticks and these pathogens move through the tick populations is an extremely dynamic and very organic, um, like moment by moment, day to day, week to week, month to month activity. So you need to see this data with that in mind. It's not like um, a continuum, like having a, a videotape. We can only go out there periodically and collect data. But what we have found is infected ticks in 42 of the 58 California counties. And currently there's only three counties, which is um, Modoc, Alpine and Mono counties here on the border uh, with Nevada, Oregon, etc., where we're pretty sure there are ticks there, we just haven't found them. And we're really gonna be focusing tonight on the Western black-legged tick, because this is the one that is um, vectors, Lyme, and also a combination of other co-infections, other pathogens here in California, the most prevalent one. So again, thinking about how data is collected, this is really important information because it shows you how even in the same county, we might have different infection rates of different strains of the particular type of bacteria called Borrelia bacteria that um, cause Lyme. And you can see how wildly these can vary. And um, so for example, at China Camp State Park up in Marin County, on one particular gathering exercise, our tick ecologists discovered that up to 25% of those ticks were infected with Borrelia bugoferi, and then another substrain of the Borrelia, which is Mayamotoi, both of which kind of fall under the Lyme umbrella. And you can see how from park to park and from county to county, these infection rates can really vary tremendously. So where are these ticks coming from? How are these pathogens moving around? Um, it's a combination of different things. We now know, obviously, that all of these kinds of speed, different species of animals and insects are interconnected. Many of them are quite symbiotic. And as um, things like you know, climate impact uh, the ranges and the habitats of different animals and insects, one of the ways that they can get moved around is through migratory birds. And so birds, as they fly up and down the different flyways, they may pick up ticks in one place, the ticks will feed on them and then they'll drop off and then those ticks will molt and go to the next stage of their life cycle and then they will actually feed on say a small mammal like a squirrel or a rabbit or a vole and this is how these particular pathogens are getting moved around our world. But here where are they? Well you can see here that we've got um, examples there of birds. <laughs> you can see these are engorged ticks uh, around the beak and, and eyes and head of the bird but they're also found on voles, squirrel, uh, rabbits, deer, et cetera. And so the, the actual um, viruses and parasites and bacteria are in the blood of these small mammals, wherever those may be, whether they're down in Mexico or in, in South America, and then they move up the West Coast and come up to Southern and Northern California. And as I said, then those ticks drop off and refeed. And so then these become the, these are the reservoir hosts. And then what happens is the ticks get infected when they feed on the blood of these infected uh, creatures. And then if those ticks then turn around and feed on humans or other mammals, whether they're large mammals like dogs or deer or raccoons or badgers or anything like that, including humans, horses, then those, that's how these pathogens then spread. So a lot of people are really surprised to learn that a tick can actually live at least two years, um, sometimes as long as three years. So I'm gonna walk you through 
the life cycle of the tick and bear in mind that the tick has to get a blood meal in order to develop to its next stage of its life cycle. So eggs are laid and then they start out as larvae, very tiny. These larvae feed on the small mammal and they may or may not become infected. And then they become a nymphal tick, which we kind of jokingly call the teenage tick. This is the stage where all the ticks come out. It's the springtime right now. This is nymph season. And then the nymphs then turn around and feed. They can feed on large mammals or they can then refeed on the small mammal population. Then they again molt and they become an adult tick, either a male or a female tick. The male then mates with the female, he then dies. She then has to feed one more time in order to then uh, lay her eggs. She will lay her eggs in the leaf litter or the top of the dirt. And essentially then the eggs just stay there until they hatch and then you know become the larvae. So this is this uh, cycle. Interestingly, when the larvae hatch, they only have six legs. And then when they become nymphs, they have four to eight legs, uh, four on each side, and they're actually technically arachnids. Um, so they're closer to mites and spiders, those kinds of insects and animals. So they're very opportunistic feeders. Um, they'll feed on almost any animal that happens to come into their vicinity. And of course, as I've said before, if they feed on any mammal carrying the bacteria and viruses, then they'll become infected. Um, here are some of the heroes um, of things that eat ticks, uh, possums, chickens, and turkeys. And that's why an awful lot of people who live out, uh, you know, actually people on my team at Bay Area Lyme Foundation, almost everyone has chickens because that's a great way of keeping their property uh, cleared of ticks. So let's talk about what Lyme disease is. It's a bacterial infection. Uh, transmitted, it has this very distinctive spiral shape back, uh, presentation under the microscope, and we call this a spirochete. Um, it was first discovered uh, by uh, Willy Bergdorfer, but the thickness emerged back in 1975 in Lyme, Connecticut. There was this outbreak of what people thought was juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, where clusters of young uh, adults were very disabled, um, displaying very severe um, problems with their joints, muscles, etc. Some of them ended up in wheelchairs. And so Dr. Willie Bogdorf has stepped in and started to try to figure out what was going on. And he actually isolated and was able to discover that it with this particular spirochete. So that's why it's called Borrelia bogdorferi because it's named after him. And in the early or acute stage of the disease, it is almost like a flu. Um, and we'll talk about symptoms a little bit later, but if left in, untreated, that's when it can become a chronic disabling condition. So here, here's some fast facts. Lyme is actually the fastest growing vector-borne infectious disease in the United States. The CDC estimates there's almost uh, half a million new cases a year in the United States. Uh, cases are reported in all 50 states. The Western black legged ticks have been recorded, as I said, in 55 of 58 California counties. And unfortunately, Lyme is frequently misdiagnosed by doctors, especially out here on the West Coast, because it's just not something that they see as much. They may not have necessarily been trained to understand the symptoms, and they may be somewhat reluctant to treat with antibiotics because there is tremendous uh, drive for doctors not to overprescribe antibiotics because we don't want people becoming resistant to antibiotics, which we understand. But we very much um, urge people, if you think you may have been infected by a tick or exposed to ticks, or you may have Lyme, early treatment is absolutely imperative. Um, but unfortunately, up to 30% of patients can develop health issues even after having been treated because the bacteria is extremely persistent. It's very wily 
Um, it knows how to evade the immune system's defenses. And so this is one of the reasons why we need um, a better suite of accurate diagnostics for different stages of the disease, because then doctors will be able to then um, test and diagnose and treat more, efi more efficiently and effectively and reliably, which currently they don't have the tools to be able to do that. And very importantly, tick season is, I'm just gonna go back to that, tick season is year round in California. Although we have a big explosion of ticks and the nymphal ticks in the spring, you can get bitten by a tick at any time in California because we don't have the cold winters um, like they do in, in the Northeast, which may kill off a certain percentage of the tick population, although not all. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's having problems with that on the East Coast because um, they're not getting as severe cold winters as they used to, and snow is an insulating layer. And so more of the tick, a uh, larger percentage of the tick populations are actually overwintering and then surviving the winters, which they didn't necessarily used to do. So let's talk about which tick cause Lyme. Yeah, yeah. Can I interrupt you for yeah. a question related to the last slide? Yes. Um, somebody asked, what's the spread of Lyme disease around the world or is it mainly a US issue? Oh no, it's all over the world. And I would, um, I would actually encourage you to Google this information. Um, European, there are different European strains of Lyme. There's different strains of Lyme in the UK, Australia, um, uh, China. There are tick-borne diseases are on the rise globally. Um, and I am not really the right person to kind of roll those sorts of facts and percentages off my tongue easily. Um, so, but it is a worldwide uh, a growing problem. Yes. So, all right, thank you. Slide. So I am going to focus uh, on which pick cause diseases, including Lyme in California. And I've sort of singled these out by highlighting by putting California in the corner. But across the United States, this is kind of the rogues gallery, as it were, of ticks that you can be bitten by in different states and they may vector um, diseases to you. Um, the really big problematic one uh, being the Lone Star tick, which vectors Rocky Mountain spotted fever, amongst other things, to humans. And the reason I show all of these ticks, not just the ones in California, is a lot of people, you know, we travel, we go to visit, visit relatives, we may go out hiking or fishing or sit on a beach in a different state and enjoy yourself and not realize that we've actually been exposed to a tick. So it's very important that wherever you are in the country, you are aware of ticks and the possibility of being bitten by ticks. Um, so here in California, the American dog tick, the brown dog tick, the Rocky Mountain wood tick, the Pacific Coast tick, the winter tick, and our friend, the Western black-legged tick. These are the ticks that vector different diseases to humans here in California. And we're gonna focus very specifically uh, on the Western black-legged tick, because these ticks, these are the um, diseases or pathogens that ticks can vector to humans or transmit to humans. And in other, and there's like tons of them, they're all really nasty. The Bethiosis is um, actually a parasite uh, Bartonellosis or Bartonella, that the colloquial name for that is cat scratch disease. That's extremely unpleasant, very painful. Um, we believe that it gets vectored to us by ticks um, because it is so often detected and diagnosed along with the different um, top um, pathogens like Borrelia burgdorferi. The Borrelia miyamotoi, which is that other um, type of Borrelia that I pointed out when I was, gave you that slide about the different percentages of tick infections. This is also known as tick-borne relaxing fever. And so these are all uh, extremely serious if they aren't treated quickly. And then in other states, um, we also have these types of diseases 
Some of these can be vectored to humans and transmitted by a tick in as uh, little as 15 minutes and can cause brain swelling, um, allergies to meat, uh, and tick paralysis. So, you know, this is very serious stuff. Um, you need to be aware and just to educate yourself. There's only so much that I can sort of explain and share with you in a one hour talk like this. And so if you are interested, I would um, recommend that you go onto either the CDC website or you can call onto Bay Area Lyme's website and you can find out a lot more information about these particular diseases. So let's really look at the problem as to why it's so difficult to detect and then diagnose these uh, particular diseases. You can see this is an adult black-legged tick and this is a nymphal tick. And as I said before, we're right in nymph season right now, so be warned. And then these are larval ticks and you can see how tiny these are. And sometimes people will actually encounter like a nest of ticks that have, you know, clustered and crawled up a, a blade of grass. And these could actually get onto you or onto an animal. And you might not even know what these are. You might think it's just a freckle, but if it's a moving freckle, then the chance is that you've, you've picked up a tick. So this is why they're very difficult to detect because they're so easy to miss. And about half of people who are diagnosed with Lyme don't ever even recall seeing a tick and they don't recall a tick bite. And you can see when they're, and understand that when these uh, creatures are so tiny. Plus transmission times are really controversial. Um, a lot of people, if they are lucky enough to find a tick, and they actually then are able to pull the tick out and save the tick, it's because the tick has been feeding on them for some time and then it becomes swollen or what we call engorged with blood. And a lot of people will discover this, like when you're taking a shower and um, you know, you're know you washing yourself and you might suddenly find something in your armpit and you might think, oh, is that a skin tag that wasn't there yesterday? And then you investigate more and you realize that you have a tick or it could be, you know, in your groin area, or it could be at the back of your neck. I mean, these things will just essentially embed themselves. They're just very opportunistic. They, all they care about is where is my next meal coming from so that I can get to the next stage of my life cycle. And the reason we talk about the fact that transmission times are so controversial is because at Bay Area Lyme Foundation, we really believe that there isn't a safe period for attack to be attached to you. Um, you know, if you go online, you'll see things online say, oh, you don't need to worry if a tick's only been, uh, if it's been uh, attached to you for less than 36 hours or 72 hours, don't worry, just pull it out, flush it, and just go about your business. But in fact, the bacteria and pathogens, parasites, viruses, etc may actually be in the saliva of the tick and it may actually be uh, in the tick mouth parts. So, and some ticks are also, we think like super spreaders. So there's still a lot of things that we don't know about ticks and we're learning about ticks. So um, just always err on the side of caution because their mouth parts are really perfectly designed to avoid detection and avoid being knocked out or dislodged because the tick saliva is the combination of an anesthetic, so when it bites you, you won't feel it, an adhesive, so it will like glue itself into that little incision that is made in your skin, and also it's an anticoagulant. So once it gets the blood flowing and gets into a capillary, the blood keeps flowing into the tick and into the midgut of the tick. And it is the midgut of the tick where the bacteria reside and the bacteria need live mammalian blood in order to get activated. And they get excited because until this blood meal comes, this live warm blood, mammalian blood comes, the spirochetes are just kind of hanging out and they're sort of a bit dormant, a bit sleepy. But as soon as that blood starts coming into the midgut, then the bacteria migrate 
from the mid gut of the tick down here and then move through the mouth parts and then into the bloodstream. Um, Joe, yeah. another question that came in that I actually yeah. think you might have just answered, but I want to clarify in case other people have the same question. Um, somebody asked, did I hear, I think from earlier in the presentation, did I hear that ticks get infected by getting blood from mammals, lizards, and birds, and not from their tick mothers, or both? This makes it sound like Lyme bacteria is being transferred back and forth from ticks and their hosts. Yes, Lyme bacteria is being transferred back and forth between ticks and the reservoir host, the reservoirs of the bacteria. So for example, you know, a, a tick, maybe a completely uninfected tick, lots of us, I'm sure, as children were bitten by uninfected ticks. And I talk to people all the time who are very dismissive and say, oh my gosh, when I was growing up, I was bitten by ticks all the time. I was always pulling them off myself. I rolled around in the dirt and, you know, nobody ever got sick. Well, that's understandable because back in maybe, I don't know, I mean, I was born in the 60s. Okay, so, you know, maybe in the 70s when we were 10 year olds or 80s when we or whatever, we were all 10 year olds. There wasn't that much of this um, bacterial reservoir that had been fomenting and moving through the mammal population. But once you get a rabbit or a squirrel or a deer or, you know, a vole that gets infected and then say that mouse or rabbit gets, um, say, 100 ticks feed on that rabbit and then they become infected and then they go to the next stage of their life cycle and then they go out and they're looking for blood meal. And then that's how these pathogens then get amplified and you know, um, compounded, the infections get compounded through the mammalian populations. And yes, some tick mothers can pass pathogens onto their offspring through their eggs and larvae. And we don't necessarily understand exactly how that's happening and exactly which picks do that, but we know that it is happening. Okay. okay. And then we had um, two other questions, but since I've already stopped you, I'll ask them too. Um, yeah. So one is kind of a follow-up to the earlier question about the worldwide uh, prevalence of Lyme. Yeah. Somebody asked, is there any coordination or sharing of information internationally regarding Lyme disease and tick-borne illnesses? Oh yes, tremendously so. There is an organization called ILADS, uh, International Lyme uh, Doctors Association, and they meet once a year in the fall and people come from all over the world and share information share research, uh, we attend, uh, scientists share papers, et cetera, about what is going on globally with Lyme and tick-borne diseases. Yeah. Great. And then the final question for now, um, somebody asked, do ticks move around the body to find a better location or do they attack where the exposed areas of the body are where they first land? Um, ticks crawl up. So that's why a lot of uh, people will find ticks um, at the back of the knee or at the a constriction point at like the waistband, or say you brush your shoulder against a bush or a tree where a tick might be hanging out and then the tick will crawl in your clothing and find a gap in your clothing and it may crawl down. Uh, a lot of women will find ticks around like where their bra strap is, armpits, etc. but What's very interesting is that if you go onto a website called tickreport.org, they actually record the different parts of the body where people are reporting being bitten. And, um, you know, at different times of year and different stages of life cycle, certain ticks seem to like the upper thigh, for example, some ticks like the back of the arm, some ticks like the shoulder, some ticks like the head. It's it, they are just extremely opportunistic. And if they find a spot where they can dig in and embed themselves, they will. So it's not just exposed skin, they will get in under your clothing. Yeah. And we'll talk about 
that a little bit later and how to prevent it. So let's talk about the visual signs of Lyme disease. Um, so the classic visual sign of Lyme, which most doctors will recognize and understand is the classic bullseye rash. Um, technically it's called an erythema migrans because it is an expanding rash, but it's not just a bullseye. It can be round, oval, triangular, and very irregular shape. And what the, the key thing to look for is, is this the rash that seems to be expanding out from a central point? And one of the things that people do when they're in the know is if they find that they've got a strange rash on their body, you can take a Sharpie and just draw a line around the edge of the rash. And then if that rash goes beyond the edge of the Sharpie, within a couple of days of you having draw, uh, found that rash on your body, you should, you should suspect that it's an erythema migrans, a migrating rash, and you should get to the doctor straight away. The rash isn't normally itchy or painful, but it can be warm. Um, and it's often misdiagnosed as a spider bite or cellulitis. Now, one of the things that's really tricky, and as we get into this, you're gonna be going, oh my gosh, because one of the things about Lyme that's so difficult was when people ask a question and you have to go, mm, it depends, because almost every single thing about Lyme, it's so variable, and it's so dependable on objective interpretation of information. But some people are actually allergic to tick saliva. So they could get bitten by a tick, even an uninfected tick that has no pathogens in it. And then they could actually develop an allergic reaction to the tick saliva. But the thing about an allergic reaction is that typically this will occur within about 24 hours of a bite. They do, you don't get that expanding rash thing, that expansion around the site. And um, they typically don't spread. So the key thing about these rashes is that they can occur anywhere from between three and 30 days after having been bitten. So that's why you've got to be really alert if you're out hiking, mountain biking, climbing, you know, out trail running, et cetera. You've really got to be aware of what's going on with your body. And then here's the other really disappointing thing particularly out here in California, because we have these substrains of Lyme, is that the rash doesn't appear on any, everybody who has actually been exposed to Lyme. It's about 30% of people don't get any rash at all. So if you think about the fact that about half of people never see the tick and they don't remember getting bitten, and then of the people who you know do get bitten, only about 70% of people even ever get a rash, it, it, you can see why diagnostically this is a huge challenge. So you definitely should be uh, alert to ex expanding rashes, like I just said. This is the classic tick bite rash, which most doctors will recognize and go, oh yeah, it looks like the Target logo. You get something like that on your body, you know that you've been bitten by a tick. Problematically, this type of presentation of rash is less common in California. This is a much more common uh, tick bite rash. And this is what is often misdiagnosed as cellulitis. And uh, sometimes the rashes almost have like a blue sort of hue to them. And then as the bacteria disseminate, uh, which is the very um, sort of dangerous acute part of this disease where the bacteria is actually now in the bloodstream and the bacteria is starting to replicate in the bloodstream, you might also get multiple rashes. And so if you see something like this uh, on your body anywhere and you start seeing these rashes appearing, you should definitely get to the doctor. So let's talk about the stages of Lyme. There's three Clinically, there's three stages that um, that doctors understand, doctors to see and treat Lyme and understand how serious it is. So within days of exposure, you're going to be in the acute stage. 
of the disease, flu-like symptoms, like fever, chills, fatigue, muscle aches, joint pain, headaches, swollen lymph nodes. And you might think, oh, you know, I've got a summer flu or a, a case of the flu. The number one symptom that people seem to report the most frequently is a headache, a bad headache. And if you then leave that and you don't get this treated, within weeks to months of exposure, you may start to really uh, experience the stiffness, like arthritis type symptoms uh, in your joints. You may get a bell's palsy or fallen face type uh, symptom, so, uh, numbness, tingling, shooting pains up and down the arms and legs. And in about 10% or less of problems, you may experience like a tachycardia or arrhythmia type uh, symptom. And then if, again, uh, after months to years after being bitten, um, this is when people end up in wheelchairs because their joint pain and the swelling of their joints is so bad. Um, they may lose uh, the ability to walk. They may experience tremendous issues with uh, fine motor skills, not being able to write, dress themselves, etc. And then also very uh, upsettingly, very severe neurological um, complaints. Um, and problems with memory and recall. Uh, unfortunately, that spirochete, which was that very significant corkscrew shape bacteria that I showed in the early slide, the issue is that it has the capability to drill through the tissues of the body and it can actually cross the blood brain barrier. The spirochete doesn't really like hang out in the bloodstream for very long. It prefers the deep tissues of the body, the joints. Um, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the gallbladder, the brain, et cetera. And so um, it prefers a, a less like a less oxygenated environment and it will colonize uh, in all these different parts of the body and even create um, what we call biofilms where it shields itself from the immune system and stays undetected and then can suddenly erupt and start to replicate, which is one of the reasons why people who have Lyme, they will go through periods where the Lyme is, so it seems to be under control and seems to be dormant and they seem to be doing okay. And then all of a sudden, months, years can go by and then they can experience a resurgence of the bacteria where it starts to kind of come out and wreak havoc in the body. Terrible. Um, so what do you do if you get bitten? Let's talk about prevention because this is the, this is the money business, people. This is what you showed up to learn. Pin your ears back, take it seriously. Okay, you can prevent Lyme by seeing a doctor as soon as possible as soon as you suspect that you may have been bitten because you've started to develop symptoms that sound a bit like Lyme, uh, or you've had a rash, or you saw the tick that bit you, or any of the above. See a doctor as soon as possible. You need to ask for an antibiotic. Ideally, get doxycycline. Doxycycline is a very cheap drug. It's been around for a very long time. And um, you need a minimum, uh, we say, of 21 days. And the reason for that is because the Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria is, a very, is very slow to replicate. It only replicates about every two to two and a half weeks. So if you go to the doctor and you say, I think I have Lyme, and he or she says, oh, well, here's the prescription for seven days of antibiotics. This will help. This will sort you out. No, it won't. Because even if you take those antibiotics, as soon as you stop taking them, if you haven't hit the window of when the bacteria is going to be replicating in your bloodstream, then that, 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 that antibiotic is useless to you. So you need to get 21 days of antibiotics at least. Some of our allied doctors actually say 28 days because you want to have that antibiotic in your bloodstream and it's systemically in your body so that when the bacteria goes into its replication cycle, it gets knocked on the floor because the doxycycline is actually an anti-replication drug. And that's what you need to have, okay? But importantly, 
even after you have finished taking the antibiotic and completed the course, you must continue to monitor yourself for symptoms. Because as I said earlier, as much as 30% of people, even if they have been treated, they have persistent symptoms. Lyme is a very persistent bacteria. We know that it can survive antibiotic treatment. You have to get aggressive with it. And we have proven this through um, mouth studies that Bayer and Lyme founded, uh, funded, sorry. So we know that it, the bacteria persists and you need to get very serious and aggressive with treatment. And here's why um, we have a diagnostic problem, because it would be so wonderful if you could go to the doctor and get a blood test, and then that doctor could tell you definitively within a day whether or not you have Lyme in your system. Um, say you have 100 people with Lyme disease, and then only about half of them see a, see a tick or have a rash, and then only about half of those people see a doctor. And then the current testing that we have available uh, which is a two-stage testing um, protocol, actually misses uh, about 60% uh, of people who actually have Lyme. So you can see why this is so important and why Bay Area Lyme Foundation has been investing heavily in uh, funding researchers who um, have projects that are very promising in terms of developing not just a diagnostic that can detect Lyme in the acute or early stage, but at the different stages of the disease development. And because no reliable diagnostic test or accurate diagnostic test currently exists, the average Lyme patient sees five doctors over nearly two years before they're correctly diagnosed. And one of my colleagues, um, it took her 10 years and she saw 17 doctors before she was um, diagnosed with Lyme. And this young lady in the wheelchair is actually um, somebody that I know personally who um, was incredibly sick and in tremendous pain and just so debilitated. Um, and it was heartbreaking, but um, she, she actually was so, she was very lucky that um, her family was able to afford this, but she actually went to Germany for treatment. And she was in Germany for a year at a facility in Germany. And now she is doing really well. Um, so one of the issues here in the States is that a lot of doctors, once you've been treated with that first course of antibiotics, they're very reluctant to retreat you because they say, oh, it must be something else. So these are common misdiagnoses of the, oh, it must be something else. Um, flu, a viral infection, Epstein-Barr virus, mono, um, anxiety, depression. So many um, patients, especially women, unfortunately, will be sent away with antidepressants. They'll be told it's an autoimmune immune disease that they have. Actually, Lyme carditis is a known thing when the Lyme gets into your heart. And um, a Lyme doctor that we funded for many years called Dr. Neil Spector. He actually had a heart transplant um, because of Lyme disease. And he sadly succumbed to Lyme or the um, other um, problems associated with Lyme and, and died about three years ago. Chronic fatigue syndrome is a very frequent misdiagnosis. Fibromyalgia, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid disorders, ALS, dementia. And these three, these things at the bottom in green, this is what you should look for. If all of a sudden you're perfectly normal, delightful, wonderful, if not often trying child or children suddenly develop strange behaviors. So for example, say they've always been just fine at school, you know, doing the thing, playing sport, et cetera. And then all of a sudden they just really start to have all kinds of psychiatric disorders or problems or behavioral problems at school. But suddenly out of the blue, they develop some kind of strange learning disability and they haven't ever been learning different. Um, you should suspect that they may actually have been infected with something and it could be a tick bite or Lyme. So, or one of those other things like Bartonella, for example. So let's talk about prevention. I'm looking at the time here. I've got about 
just about 10 minutes. I can do this. Okay, there is this magic um, chemical. Yes, it's a chemical. I know a lot of people have very strong feelings about chemicals. I use this. I go horseback riding, hiking, um, I'm hiking on trails, etc. I love being outside. I have been using this chemical for a number of years. It's actually a derivative of chrysanthemum. It's very cheap. You spray it on your clothes and then you let them dry naturally. Just let them air dry. And then they're good for about six or seven washes. And when the ticks get on your clothing, they will die. So they don't have that chance to like crawl up and then get up your pants leg or up your you know between your socks and your pants or down the neck or up the sleeve of your shirt because once they get onto the fabric that's been treated they will die um if you don't fancy doing it yourself or you just don't have the kind of setup at home that allows you to do it outside you can send your clothing away to be treated by this wonderful organization called insect shield and you can just stick out those um, out of clothes in a you know flat rate box in the post, send it over there, they'll send it back and um, you can go on the website, they tell you how to do it, it's fabulous, okay? And you can get this stuff from Outdoor Clothiers or Amazon, yes, I said it. Um, the other thing is, is that we strongly recommend, and again, we know people don't like DEET, but it is the most effective insect repellent, and we suggest that you use a product that has more than 20% DEET. I use one that has 30% always, and um, you spray that on your exposed skin. It's a kind of, as we say in England, belt and braces, kind of, or you say here, you say belt and suspenders type of approach. So you treat your clothing and then you treat your exposed skin. But if you are looking to use um, natural repellent, nothing wrong with that. Just do your homework. Make sure that you know what you're buying because there's a lot of different products out there and um, you need to reapply them a lot more frequently because especially if you're using sunscreen as well, sunscreen can actually reduce the efficacy of natural repellent. Learn the right way to remove a tick. Okay, we've all heard about, well, when we were younger, you know, you'd scrape it off with a credit card or light a match under it or put a lit cigarette under it or smother it with Vaseline, all these different things. Don't do that. Because if you do that, you could shock the tick. And when you shock a tick, guess what it does? It regurgitates the entire contents of its midgut into the thing it's feeding on. Thereby, you are completely doing the exact opposite of what you're trying to achieve, okay? So what you do is you grasp the tick as close to your skin as possible and you use needle nose tweezers or a tick removal tweezer. Don't use flat heavy tweezers, the type that you used to you know, pluck your eyebrows or whatever because you could inadvertently snap the head off the tick. And then you pull firmly, but gently away from the skin and don't twist it or yank it because you could shock the tick. And I just described what happens when you do that. You don't want to do it and avoid alternative methods. Or you can use a tick removal tool if you um, don't have tweezers. You can just throw one of these in your you know, purse or in the car or hang it in the shower to remind yourself to check for ticks, okay? And then very importantly, save the tick for testing. Do not throw the tick away. Keep some of those little clever mini snack baggies in your, you know, outdoor gear in the, or, you know, uh, in a pocket of your backpack or in the central median car, you know, where you throw your chewing gum and all that kind of stuff and save the tick for testing. Because if you test the tick, you can find out if it was infected with anything. Other practical tips for you, wear lighter colored clothing, wear long pants and sleeves, tuck your pants into your socks. Another tip is when you come home from being outside, run your clothing through the dryer before you wash it, because this will defecate the tick and kill the ticks if you have ticks on your clothing. Um, because ticks can actually survive water and being washed. They can survive hot water washes 
um, less than 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So you don't want that. But don't throw your clothing in the dryer if you've been around poison oak. Because if you have poison oak on your clothing and you put those in the dryer, then you're going to need a new dryer and you're going to be very upset with me. And I will say, I told you so. So don't do that, okay? And if you're lucky enough to have a separate laundry room, a great thing to do is put up signs and remind, you know, say, check for ticks or put them in the bathroom or hang your tick remover device um, up by the bathroom cabinet or something or clip it to your water bottle. Just remind yourself to check the ticks, okay? And here's where, essentially everywhere, everywhere. We have found ticks in all these kinds of places. And you should be, if you're out and about, um, even gardening, uh, most uh, incidences of ticks actually in the United States are what we call peridomestic, which is kind of, I was kind of in my yard or in the trees next to my house or, you know, at the local park or something like that, or even the beaches. We found ticks, did a tick sweep it was back in 2018 and we've actually found uh, ticks at the beaches in California, which was a big surprise for us. We didn't know that they were there. They are. But you need to check all over your body, okay? And a lot of people ask about pets. Um, we love our pets, we love our dogs, but sometimes they can uh, bring in uh, uninvited guests and hitchhikers into the house. And your dogs and animals, horses can get Lyme, they do get Lyme. Uh, they can get uh, tested for Lyme at the veterinarians and dogs actually, uh, you can vaccinate your dogs uh, against Lyme disease and um, we recommend that you do that. Stay on top of your animal to flee and pick medication. It is so incredibly important. We don't advise that you sleep with your animals for this reason um, because the tick and flea medication is not completely foolproof. And even if you're on it and you're really vigilant about it, you could still have a tick crawl onto you at night and sit there feeding on you happily during the night. Let's not do that, okay, people. So here's where to get ticks tested. Uh, these are the three labs that we recommend and they are fast and very cheap compared to paying out of pocket for um, a case of chronic or persistent Lyme and the kinds of uh, therapies that are available to, available to people right now. Tick report is pretty cool because you can send your tick there, they'll turn around and they'll give the, the results as to whether the tick was infected or not with anything relatively quickly, I think within a couple of days. And they have all these really cool graphics on there. And it's real-time data because they're getting ticks sent to them all the time from all over the United States. And you can do searches by county and state and all kinds of interesting data. Um, because we recommend this because say you found a tick embedded in yourself, you pull it out, you put it in a little baggie with a little moist piece of paper towel because you don't want that tick to desiccate and dry out in the mail. So stick something moist in there, like a cotton moist cotton ball or something like that. Zip it up, send it off to one of these people and they will test it for everything. And then with that data, say if you are unfortunate enough to have been bitten by an infected tick, you can take that information to the doctor if you begin to develop symptoms. And then you can say, I know that this tick was infected with this, these pathogens. I need 21 days of doxycycline and I'm not leaving here till you give it to me. That's what I would do. So it's, you know, sometimes you've got to advocate for yourself and stick up for yourself. It's not the doctor's fault. Doctors are scientists, doctors want what's best for their patient. And without an accurate diagnostic test currently available, it is very difficult for doctors who are not familiar with Lyme and tick-borne diseases to really be able to make that call. And you're here tonight and you're learning this information and you can help educate your physicians about Lyme disease in California because there is Lyme disease in California. And if you meet a doctor who says that there isn't, just tell them to go on our website. 
So let's summarize. Oh, look at this, 6.56, we're pretty good, four minutes. Remove ticks immediately, save the ticks for testing, treat your clothing with permethrin, use more than 20% DEET on exposed skin. If you have long hair, tuck it up into a hat, wear long sleeves, shirts, pants, and then run your clothing through the hot dryer before washing, save the tick for testing, watch for symptoms, and tick check every day and go to the doctor if you get bitten. All right, so um, before I wrap this up, I know some of you probably have lots more questions and it's uh, always a pleasure for me to answer them. And so this is my email address, joe at bayarealign.org. And if you want to receive our newsletter, which we put out uh, only three to four times a year, we do not swamp your inbox. We're really nice people. Um, please put your email 